there's this whole desire by young people, and, and I think most people, to be independent. Um, one of the things we're learning about in this history unit is Westerners love their independence, that this idea that you could go out and make something of yourself on the land, you know, pick yourself up by the bootstraps. American independence isn't just about being free from Britain. It's not just about being free from government, but being a self-made person. You know, yesterday we had some of the girls saying, oh, uh, you know, if I make something of myself, I want to keep my name. I would be proud of that. And we have some of the guys saying my name has has worth. You know, it represents my family and what it's it's done. I want to keep that and hold on to that. But are you free individuals? It's not it's not uh, coincidence that the transcendentalism movement, the abolition movement, the women's rights movement, westward expansion, right? Uh, mass democracy of the Jacksonian era where people, regardless of their property, are voting. It's not a coincidence these things all overlap. The spirit of the individual is very strong in this era. So let, let me ask you again, are you free? How many times since you woke up this morning have you had to do something you didn't want to do? How many Every periods day. are there in a class day? <laughs> eight. Eight periods in a class day. Whoa. Whoa. So at least eight times you've had to do something yeah. you didn't want to do. Waking up is nine. All right. Going to work is ten. What? Eating healthy this morning. Are you fulfilling? My mom is always diet time. <laughs> are you fulfilling your potential? Are you living your best life? Is is a ter is a phrase that I hear thrown a lot around a lot lately, living my best life? Are you? Or are you a slave to society? School system. You're a slave to school? Okay. Is it? Well, I could go to right now. College, but are you and drop out and be just. I think we need a. Why are you taking AP classes? Don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> he loves his teachers. Oh, I do like. It. I do like. It. I think I'm gonna drop AP Lingo. You are. That class sucks. <laughs> She's nice. But I'm already not. I love Miss McGraw. That class is. All right. So, we're going to explore some of these questions that the transcendentalists were bringing up. We saw on Monday with religion that. Uh, there's kind of this backlash to science that's taking place in the beginning of the 19th century. People are saying, you know, there's got to be something different about humans than the animals, right? There's got to be something that transcends the natural universe and, and burns inside of us special like a light, which is why the transcendentalist movement is called the transcendentalist movement, this belief that human existence transcends nature, that you need to be able to find that within yourself because when you find what's special about you, when you find what is unique about you and your potential, then you will really uh, start to understand the universe. You'll start to understand yourself. You'll start to be a happier, fuller person. That is what the meaning of life is, not to be a cog in a big machine, right? It's not ironic or it's not coincidental that this is the time where people are leaving their farmsteads. You know, the, the subsistence farmer is going away and people are moving into the factory and, and, and working um, wage jobs. They don't necessarily have control over themselves. So... This movement is a reaction to how the United States is moving away from individualism and towards this kind of collective society. Moving away from independent states towards union is a big part of it. Okay, so this is wrapped up in the philosophy and the mindset of what it means to be American, right? In other words, the things that transcendentalists stand for are individualism, self-expression, finding yourself, becoming your best self, having self-worth. 
On the contrary, what transcendentalists don't represent or what they're against is this idea of someone else telling you what your worth is. And how often does that happen? Okay, that we measure our own worth based on some outside factor that we're not in control of or the opinions of others, right? We define ourselves by um, some kind of measurement, whether it's money or grades or uh, playing time and you name whatever activity. We define ourselves based on external measures as opposed to internal measures. So they did not like, they, they rebel against these traditional forms of authority, whether it's the military or the government or public common education. How many of you often feel like school just is this conveyor belt that where you have teachers cramming your heads full of useless knowledge and when you get to the end of the conveyor belt, you're going to be booted out in the reality of the of the real world with and you're not going to be better for it right it's true but the way our system is set up to get jobs our system is set up to get jobs yeah I, sometimes i wonder if our system isn't set up to just pad the pocketbooks of colleges right i mean how many people are going into the trades right now? If right, the biggest the biggest demand for workers and probably the best course to job security right now are through the trades. And yet, just like a factory, with John Baylor leading the way, big neon sign saying this way to success, you're pushed from one class to another. You're pushed into AP classes. You're pushed in to get great grades. You're pushed in to take the ACT. Everybody tells you the way to success is college. Then you go to college. Everybody comes out of college and they say, you know, college degree isn't enough. You need to get your master's. So you go and get your master's. And when you finish your education, you've got $50,000 of student debt and you've got a job that you don't really like, that you have to work nine to five or you get fired. Is that freedom? Is that what you're looking for in life? Is that the independence that you're all seeking? No. Okay. Please. You know, and so the transcendentalists were quick to point out chains come in a lot of different forms, right? What good is this information your head is being cramped? Is that a real education? Okay. Now, Obviously, I represent the man. I represent the system. I hope. Well, you can say it's hypocritical. I hope. I'm trying to. I'm trying the best I can to point towards these thinking skills having use down the road. So, whether you ever step foot in history again, history class again, that that your brains have taken a big step towards thinking for themselves and not just accepting what's handed to you as the gospel, but that you can critically think about what you're reading, what you're hearing, what's expected of you. Anyway, that's how I justify myself being part of the system of oppression. Um, the transcendentalists like Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Henry David Thoreau, all of you guys have seen Henry David Thoreau. His picture stares at you and you walk in the library. It says, I'm thoroughly unimpressed. Mrs. Brock's desk, right? Um, no, it's Henry David Thoreau. It's a play off of his, his name. Oh, oh, okay. Come on, Tom Jack. Come on, Tom Jack. I want to talk about a couple of famous transcendentalists, starting with Ralph Waldo Emerson. Okay. The reason that we need to talk about Emerson is he really defines this movement as far as what does it stand for? And we're going to have a conversation here in a second about transcendentalism in your lives. Um, but he stresses this idea of self-reliance. In fact, that's the name of one of his seminal works is self-reliance. You guys all want to be independent. You all want to have some sense of value, some sense of worth. In fact, right now, you probably struggle a little bit with your own self-worth. Okay? And we're going to talk about that here in a second. 
what Thoreau stresses is that you got to get out of the establishment. And this is why people like Emerson and Thoreau go off into cabins. If you want to know why they're writing about ants and leaves of grass and those kinds of things, it's about meditation. It's about shutting out the noise. I see, this is what I see a lot in, in school. You guys, people, not just, not just high school students, people can't handle their own thoughts. The world is beating on our consciousness at a 10 out of 10 volume all the time. You got a teacher lecturing at you. Then you put the earbud in, you got the music going. You sit down at lunch, you're looking at social media and music and all kinds of things, keeping your brain going. Then you go to another lecture. Then you put the earbud in and when the school day's done, you go and you engage in some kind of activity that you have to focus on. Then you go home and you got homework and you got to focus on that. And the brain is going 100% all the time, never thinking about the meaning of your life, never thinking about your own thoughts, but thinking about someone else's thoughts. Amen. Now, okay, what better way to get in tune with your own thoughts and, and think about the meaning of life than to go out in nature and study the simple su stuff and see how complex it is, okay? When was the last time you stopped and you looked at the beauty and the intricacy of a simple snowflake which is really quite complex, right? Okay. Do any of your teachers, uh, I don't know if PE does this or psychology, have you guys done any mindful meditation? Yes. yes. All the time. You hate it. You hate mindful. Why? You don't like focusing on your breathing? It's kind of like, I love meditation. It's so weird. I don't what? know how to describe it, but like, it sounds like they're talking. Yeah. Let all your mind Henry. space. No. How often do you do that? I'm saying, how often do you take it seriously and shut your mind off to distraction? We're always distracted. It doesn't matter. And if there's a moment of silence, people, everybody's like, I'm overwhelmed. I'm burnt. I, I'm overworked. I'm, I, I've got all this homework. I never have a time for myself. And the minute people have time for themselves, they pick up another distraction, right? They don't actually focus on themselves. Yeah, Rob. One thing I don't like about it is like, it's hard to take them seriously. Like in one of the things it's like, it's like, if you wish to re-enter your state of awareness, simply open your eyes. <laughs> I mean, like. Here's what that's saying to you, though. So often we are unconsciously just being forced from one situation to another. You don't actually take control over yourselves, right? Usually you get distracted by one thought or another without any real choice. So what it is doing is putting you in the weird situation where you're actually consciously trying to control your thoughts, which you're not used to. You're used to your thoughts controlling you. You're used to the world controlling you. So the minute you're asked to quiet your mind and choose to focus on your breathing, you're fighting because your brain's like, no, no, no. Think about this. Think about this. You have to choose to stop it. And yeah, it sounds a little corny, uh, a little bit like um, hippie-ish. But how often do your thoughts control you as opposed to you controlling your thoughts? So these places of meditation like Walden, that's Thoreau's place. You guys read Walden in AP Lit or in Chapter 11? Or, I mean, 11, English 11. What do you remember about Walden? Anybody like Walden? Are you the first class to admit you didn't like Walden? What did you not like about it? It's why is it why is it confusing? Because he's talking about his imagination. It's like making up the like the first thing is you imagine yourself like a little Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else? He's out there writing whole pages on ants. This is wild. Like I like why? He did a lot of crap. Like, I got to do crap. When he, when he like, writes, he writes from like 
I'm a realtor. And then all of a sudden he changes and he changes and cha you're like, what? Yeah, I don't like, understand down, so. what the story is. Like, slow down, I understand that like, it's supposed to symbolize certain things, but that doesn't make for an entertaining like, piece of literature. Okay. What if it's not meant to be entertaining? What if it's meant to be therapeutic? Well, it ain't. Okay. Sean Preacher. Well, it ain't. A book is not entertaining. We'll go do something else, at least for like kids like us, because there's so many other entertaining things to do. See, but that's just it. Entertainment is stimulation. You guys can't go without stimulation. It's an addiction. Well, <laughs> what what happens? What ha happens if you run a machine full bore without any kind of rest? It overheats. It's gonna over. It's it's going to have breakdowns. If you want to know why so many young people have mental health issues, is because you're running on constant stimulation, whether it's whether it's imposed or self-induced constant stimulation to the point that number one you can't handle breaks of rest and number two you run out of gas and you have breakdown period um walden is about that walden is about getting back to this contemplative state where you can find your true self um the thing i want to focus though on about thoreau is he also has a major impact on civil rights movements. Okay? What do I mean by that? Well, you guys also, I heard that you guys think Thoreau's a big whiner. That uh, he gets thrown in jail for a couple of nights and he thinks he's special. Come on, who, who is not impressed by Thoreau? I don't remember. You did, you... So here's the story about Henry David Thoreau, okay, uh, as it applies to history and just to jog your memory about English. Um, Thoreau is an avid opponent to the Mexican-American War. Okay? He sees our invasion of Mexico as a bold-faced land grab for slavery, and he's, a, he's an abolitionist. The idea that our country would attack Mexico, just to expand its territories, this idea of manifest destiny, westward expansion, that isn't the America that fought off Brit Britain the tyrant. That's America becoming the tyrant and doing exactly what Britain had done in its colonial time. On top of that, the whole point is to expand this institution of slavery because he feels that our country is in the wrong, he refuses to pay his taxes, okay? Because he doesn't pay his taxes, he gets thrown in jail. And while he's in jail, he writes this essay about civil disobedience, that it is your responsibility as a person to stand up against a government that's oppressive. We did it during the American Revolution, okay? But that when a law is unjust, it's not just right, but it is your duty to oppose it. Now, why is this important in the long game, not just the Mexican-American War? It's because Thoreau is going to inspire people like Mahatma Gandhi, who's going to use nonviolent civil disobedience to um, protest British colonialism in India. Gandhi and Thoreau are going to inspire Martin Luther King and Bayard Rustin, leaders of the civil rights movement, to use nonviolent civil disobedience to oppose segregation. It's not going to be Malcolm X who takes a militant stance, stance against segregation that's really remembered and revered. It's going to be Martin Luther King and the idea that the best way to oppose an unjust government is to break the law in a peaceful way. So whether or not you were impressed with Thoreau or Emerson, or Whitman, these transcendentalist authors have a huge impact on culture and politics and art that still resonates today. Okay, so here's my question to you for you to have a little bit of a group discussion. Okay, what gives you value? What's your value? What, what's your worth? Why, 
What are you contributing to the world? What do you bring to the world? Okay. What is it? How do you base your value? Okay. I'll talk to your table. What gives you value? Isn't that kind of sad? Isn't that concerning that isn't it concerning that we have, you guys haven't thought about what your value is, what your worth is? <laughs> well, here's what I'm hearing, okay? This is what I'm hearing from these conversations you guys are bringing up. Number one, you're putting a lot of investment or you are you are attaching your own value to the opinions and the engagement of others. That without others, you have no value, Right? So whether it's grades, you know, and, and just to point that uh, as far as the grades go, that a grade will give you worth. If you were to go to an easier class, you would have a higher grade and then you would have a greater sense of self-worth, even if your effort or abilities haven't changed from that more difficult class where your grades lower, that your opinion is based on a meaningless number or letter that someone else gives you or a laugh that someone else gives you or a dollar that someone else gives you right and then i hear a lot of you saying i'm kind of uncomfortable with that i i don't know we're not, isn't it kind of like bragging if we see that we have value no you know the healthiest people mentally the healthiest people are those that have a healthy self-esteem there's nothing wrong with having a healthy self-esteem, right? Those people know that in times of trouble that they're still okay with themselves. Couldn't, like with this grade thing, you know, you do your best and whatever comes of it, you're okay with yourself. You, your value hasn't changed, not to you, not to you in that case. And then I hear a lot of you saying, I haven't thought about this. What does that say about the distractions of the world? What does it say about the lack of priority of you guys actually finding out who you're supposed to be, who you are, what your value is? How can you be contributing members of society if you don't know your own selves? Right? Instead, we put all this emphasis and we create all of these awards and incentives to be things others find important, valuable, right? So this is why Thoreau and Emerson withdrew from society. They, they pull back, they go into a contemplative place like Walden and consider what is my value? What is, what is the meaning to all of this? Okay, this brings us to a couple of other transcendentalists. I know we're kind of running close on time. First of all, yesterday I found it really kind of concerning that so many girls, I'm not just talking about in this class, but so many girls were willing to say, you know, if I get married, I'm going to attach myself to my husband's value, my husband's name. And I hear a lot of guys saying, yeah, my name is valuable. I want to hold on to it. And I hear a lot of girls saying, oh, I want to only hold on to my name if it's worth something. Otherwise, I'll take my husband's name. OK, uh, Margaret Fuller was a feminist transcendentalist. She focused on this idea that <coughs> women need to find their values in and of themselves not in the name of their husbands, not in their role in the cult of domesticity. What makes you valuable? What is it that your purpose in life is? She was the editor of um, The Dial, which was the transcendentalist uh, uh, magazine, publishing these kinds of works and thoughts, okay? 
I'm bringing this up because in the test, her name will come up in, in options, different options of transcendentalists and, um, and feminists. So why do people like Walt Whitman? Last transcendentalist I want to talk about today with my lecture. And we're going to listen to Walt Whitman in one of his pieces, Leaves of Grass. Why? Why is Walt Whitman going out into, the, into a field? Instead of working a job, he goes out in a field and he sits there for hours and days writing a poem about leaves of grass, blades of grass. He's got nothing better to do. Some people will see this as just almost idleness. Uh, when we get to World War II, one of the movies I would highly recommend um, when we get to watching movies for World War II is Patton. And General George Patton, in one of his uh, landmark speeches to his unit, he's a big tank commander. Uh, Patton says that these transcendentalists, people that you're reading like Thoreau, they didn't know any more about uh, country. They didn't know anything more about duty than they knew about fornication because they're all about themselves and they were just a bunch of nerds and hippies okay now the word hippie doesn't show up in his or nerd show up in his speech but you get what i'm saying he's like you know what really matters is what you give to the unit well let's think about why these guys were going out and doing this it has more than the fact that they were idly wasting their time okay a couple of things if you're a fan of rap okay or if you're a fan of slam poetry you guys know the difference between free verse and iambic pentameter right yes okay if you're a fan of free verse free verse music free verse poetry er, poetry free verse rap you have walt whitman to thank for that he gets rid of the conventions of poetry. Poetry is this ancient art form. Usually it had iambic pentameter. There were other American poets. We'll look at uh, Edgar Allan Poe, right? A lot of his stuff is in iambic pentameter. Whitman gets rid of that. He gets rid of the fancy titles, but he keeps the spirit of poetry, which is manipulation of words to elicit emotion. Now, you may find his poetry dumb, but can you take something insignificant, like a blade of grass, and write something that is chock full of emotion and meaning and symbolism, right? What It, it takes a pretty genius brain to look at a blade of grass, some everyday old object most people pass without a second thought and to see meaning in the universe, okay? That's what transcendentalism was about, finding the inner light that the universe had to offer beyond just your scientific observation through the senses, okay? So this is what I leave you with. I want you to listen to this recitation of Leaves of Grass Recognize that part of your reason you're uncomfortable with the narrator who has a deep, drolling kind of voice is because you're oftentimes left with silence, okay? This isn't, this isn't something, you know, this isn't little Zanny <coughs> pounding your consciousness with dope beats. You have to think between the spaces. All right, here we go. Uh.